you're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the pr fact that you were overprotected and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right? And you're having some trouble with other kids and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract, but it's easier. And so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right? Roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out you say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from one to 10. So 10 is, we'll make a list of 10 things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number 10. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open because that's how you're responding to it symbolically, right? And you're gonna do that at it at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective, shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that 10 times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die, but more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. Potential is an interesting idea because it represents something that isn't yet real, yet we act like it's real. Because people will say to you, you should live up to your potential. And that potential is partly what you could be if you interacted with the world in a manner that would gain you the most information, right? Because you build yourself out of the information in the Piagetian sense. But it's deeper than that too, because we know that if you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. And so you're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances, and that'll turn on different circuits. So it's not merely that you're incorporating information from the outside world in the constructivist sense. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on, on yourself all the way down to the genetic level, and that manifests new elements of you and so one of the things that happens to people and this is a very common cultural notion is that you should go on a pilgrimage at some point to somewhere central and that would be say like the rock in the pride rock in the lion king because you take yourself out of your dopey little village and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded and then you go somewhere dark and dangerous to the central place and while you do that you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you and like partly because you're becoming informed, which means information. It means you're becoming more organized at every level of analysis, but there's also more of you too. Your best bet is truth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's always gonna do the trick, right? I mean, sometimes you go fight a dragon and it eats you. And if, the, if you being eaten wasn't a real possibility, it wouldn't be a real fight. And so you see people, like I've seen people in my clinical practice sometimes. I had one client in particular who was undergoing a particularly vicious divorce with someone who was really seriously inclined to take him out and would do pretty much everything at her disposal to do so. And I strategized with him for about three years and we did everything, like, and hyper carefully. He was a very conscientious and diligent person and he, put into practice everything that we discussed and strategized and he still pretty much, he got backed into a corner so hard that I didn't know how to help him anymore. So I would say, however, that he, like he was a very truthful person throughout that and one thing he did do was 
part of it was a custody battle. And he did manage, despite his decline, in consequence of being repeatedly cornered, I would say, he did manage to establish what I think was a lasting relationship with his kids. So he might have got enough out of what he did to justify it, even though the whole landscape was pretty awful. I think that not lying is your best bet, but life is hard and people get run over. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to emerge in any obvious sense triumphant. But if you take the alternative path, path especially when you're facing severe tribulations, let's say, and you complicate those with deceit, you can be sure that whatever tragedy that you're confronting is going to turn into not only tragedy, but something very much akin to hell. And so you might be able to at least minimize the degree of suffering, even if you can't overcome it or transcend it. And that's something. You're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge. And the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world and you take the slings and arrows of fate. And you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail and fortune might do you in. But it's your best bet. And you know, people have also, people have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people, you know. You're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. So it's... it's it beats laying in your basement and getting bitter and then doing the terrible things that bitter people do. So you can't ensure that the meaning you experience is self-determined, but you can play your role to the best of your ability and that will be good enough. And that will be good enough. That meaning, the meaning that you will find in, then, in that, I believe is sufficient to be sustaining and perhaps even sustaining through the flood. So it isn't that you can avoid catastrophe, it's that you can prepare yourself to deal with it honorably when it arrives. That's what you've got. I would say for the last 45 years, we've told psychologists have been, have been certainly to blame for this, at least in part, you're okay the way you are. That's what we tell young people. Oh, you're okay the way you are. It's like, and there's nothing worse than you can tell that you can tell someone who's young than that, especially if they're miserable, you know, and lots of them, well, if they're miserable and aimless, it's like, oh, I'm miserable and aimless, and sometimes I'm suicidal and I'm nihilistic and I don't have any direction in your life, it's in my life. It's like, well, you're okay the way you are here. And it's like, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, look, you know, you're, and you know this, you're useless. You know nothing. You haven't got started. You've got 60 years to put yourself together and God only knows what you could become. And that's so, that message is so much more, it's so funny because it's so, it's such an attack, but it's so positive because there's faith there in the, in the potential that makes up the person rather than the miserable actuality that happens to be manifesting itself at the moment. And young people respond extraordinarily well to that because, and you know that if you're a parent and you love your, your child, your son, your daughter, what you're trying to foster is the best in them. You want that to manifest itself across the course of their life. You want them to become continually more than they are, to see what they could be. And, well, and I think that's part of the great message of the West, is that that's, that's, the, that's the ethical requirement of individual being in, in, in the proper sense, is to constantly note that you're not what you could be, to take responsibility for that, and to, and to 
commit yourself like body and soul to the attainment of that ideal.